Okay. Um, uh, so the agenda for today, um, uh, you know, is going to be, um, you know, just the basics uh, and you know tenets required uh, uh, for uh, software-defined networking, and um, and it's going to be about um, open flow. Uh, what is it? How is it used? And where it is used? Uh, we are then. Uh, after we cover open flow, we are then going to talk about SDN controllers and in specific about open daylight. Um, and then I'm going to show uh, a small demo of about two use cases. Um, I'm also going to talk about the various components that are involved in the demo. And uh, that's going to, uh, and then we're going to end it with a, word, with a little, uh, you know, question and answers if uh, there are any. Um, so this is not going to take much time. Uh, I'm looking to end it uh, at about 45 to 50 minutes or so, and then um, we can have any uh, questions that uh, might come up then. Okay, so um, I'm sure I don't have to talk about this, but uh, I'll still make the customary beginning. Um, so software-defined networking. Um, what is it? Um, so it's a so it's a paradigm uh, where where we have uh, you have a um, classical router or a switch in which, um, in which the fast, fast packet forwarding, that is the data path that you see here, and the control plane are, are in two different planes right now. Um, so the paradigm of software-defined networking um, ensures that you have, you have a separate uh, data plane and a control plane. That is the plane which is making the decision and the plane which is actually doing out the work are are actually separated. So what we have today is something like this, and what we are moving towards is a centralized control plane wherein you have one single entity controlling uh, everything that is happening in the network and, and thus giving you a network which is programmable. So, so how does the centralized control plane talk to uh, each of the data planes? This is why um, this is by something called as uh, open flow, which is a protocol which we will be covering um, in in uh, deeper depth a little down the line. Um, so the so what happens in software defined networking is that uh, at the end of it all, you have you have really fast uh, you know routers or switches which are which are then acting as just dumb network devices, and the entire brain is is a centralized control plane. Uh, and the protocol that the centralized control plane uses to talk to the data planes uh, is called OpenFlow. So, so what OpenFlow provides us uh, is with an open standard to program the flow table in switches, and hence what it facilitates is a programmable networking fabric. Uh, now, uh, what is a flow table? So when a packet comes in uh, to a switch and then... Um, and then the switch needs to decide what to do with the packet. There are two routes it can take. It can it can either look up something called as a flow table, which is basically a collection of rules, um, and and it can look at those rules and decide what to do, or it can do what it has always been doing. That is, uh, it can it can you know go ahead and uh, look at its normal look at its normal Ethernet uh, processing that it always does, and uh, uh, you know go ahead with doing that. So, so the flow table um, is actually a collection of rules, which is uh, uh, which are called flows, uh, and these flows are needed by the switch to actually refer to whenever a packet comes in. So um, there can be one or many uh, tables in every switch, and each of these tables contains a list of rules. Now, this is what an open flow enabled switch um, does. So what would happen to how a normal switch behaves? So now we are uh, looking at an open flow uh, switch, and we are also looking at a normal switch. So what would happen to a normal switch? Well, um, there is there is something called as uh, an open flow, uh, you know, hybrid switch as well, which means that uh, the uh, switch would be supporting not only open flow operations, but it would but it would also support normal. Uh, you know, Ethernet-based switching operations. So, so the HP5900 series and the HP5930 uh, uh, switch that we have is actually a hybrid switch, uh, wherein we not only support open flow-based operations, but we would also support, um, you know, normal processing. 
And then the immediate next question would be, well, how would the switch differentiate what kind of action to take whenever a packet is coming in? So there would need to be a, you know, a specific classification which needs to be provided to the switch to specify what what the exact pipeline that the that the, you know traffic would potentially take. So we are looking at two pipelines. One is the open flow pipeline, and the other pipeline is the normal um, you know the the normal Ethernet pipeline. So um, so we would have to specify some kind of a rule that says that um, you know for example uh, as soon as a packet with this VLAN ID comes in or if a packet comes on to this specific port, then um, you know take the open flow pipeline or do not take the open flow pipeline. So or or you can always say with uh, within open flow hybrid switches that all packets by default go through the open flow pipeline. So um, so the classification of what needs to be uh, uh, you know dealt by by the open flow pipeline and what should not be dealt with open flow pipeline is something which is defined outside of open flow and um, that is done in the switch configuration itself. So so what does a flow then look like? So I've just um, I've just given you a screenshot here of uh, you know how a flow would uh, would you know specifically look like. So the most important part of a flow would be the um, would be the fields uh, uh, which are which are you know mentioned here. Not all of these fields are mandatory. So every flow would basically contain a switch uh, port that is um, uh, that is you know responsible for looking at uh, this particular port that is coming in. So in this flow, in this flow example that I've uh, pasted here, this flow is pertaining to every packet which is coming in through port three. Uh, and then um, all of these other criteria also need to be uh, matched for this particular flow, uh, you know, to come into picture. So I've pasted some other flows uh, on top here. Um, we see that there is a table called table zero. Uh, now remember, we have already talked about uh, uh, flow tables here, and um, and there can be more than one table. That is table, uh, you know, one, two, and so on and so forth. And uh, this table zero in this flow means that this flow belongs to table zero. Uh, the n packets here is the number of packets that this flow is matching. So each time this flow is hit and uh, this flow is consulted by the switch um, and has decided that there is a match here, this counter is what is updated. So if, if I have 10 packets coming in and all these 10 packets are, are matching flow number one, then, um, then the n packets count would actually become 10. So is n bytes. And then we have something called as a priority. So for every flow that is there, um, you can have several matching criteria like you see below. We can have a, a you know matching MAC. You can match against the MAC. You can match against the VLAN ID. You can match against the IPs and so on and so forth. And if two flows have a similar kind of uh, you know matching criteria, what then uh, you know which flow should then be uh, taken into account? That depends on the priority that is there. So the priority uh, field actually specifies the uh, uh, you know priority of the flow which is there, and uh, and higher the priority, um, better it is for that flow to be matched. Um, and then we come to the most important part, which is the actions. So every flow actually has to specify one or more than one actions that are there inside of the flow. So when a packet is coming in, and this flow is matched. The actions field is what um, is is the one which uh, uh, you know specifies or you know tells the switch that this is uh, this is what needs to be done next. So when we say output colon one or output colon two here, it means that the this packet which is coming in and is and is matched against this flow will be put on output uh, output port one or output port two, or and it will also be sent to the controller. At port 65535. So, um, so this is just how a flow looks like. Now, what happens when, when the when the you know packet comes inside a switch? So you have a packet, and that packet is coming inside a switch, and you see that there are uh, table zero to n written here, and then an uh, and an action set. So, as soon as this packet comes in. Uh, the the you know 
it's looking at table zero and then it starts uh, you know looking at all the rules to find a match and once it finds the match the the uh, packet is altered and then there is an action set which is created which means that you can either execute an action right now on that packet alter the packet and then send it forward or you can actually add to a to a set of actions that can uh, that can you know possibly take place um, which needs to be executed much later um, at the end so and then what happens is the uh, packet traverses forward and then goes into table 1 um, and then the you know, packet is altered sent forward and the list of all the actions that have been there uh, or you know that have been accumulated are then applied onto the packet and the packet is sent out appropriately so this is this is how the packet flows uh, um, is um, you know as soon as it arrives into a switch so uh, how does an open flow table look like so a table contains a list of flows and each of these flows have a set of rules um, these rules specify uh, the you know switch port the vlan id the uh, source mac the destination mac and so on and each of these flows apart from the rules also have a set of actions like we have seen earlier now these are these are the several different several different classifications of the uh, you know kinds of actions that can take place uh, and we can have um, about 52 or more actions that are there right now which can be taken uh, at least in the 1.3 specification and uh, 1.3 is still not the latest 1.4 and 5 uh, are also out in open flow so apart from this um, we've also seen that there are several stats that are available uh, to all the to all the flows so if you look at this part we see that the number of packets the number of bits etc these are the number of uh, so these are the uh, meters or these are the uh, you know stats that are available to a uh, to a flow um, both at the flow level and at the table level uh, for us to um, you know look at whether the flow is actually being uh, uh, you know executed or not so this is how a generic open flow uh, table looks like so what we have seen so far is uh, you know what is open flow open flow is actually a protocol um, which is used uh, by the sdn controllers to talk to open flow enable switches both hybrid um, and open flow only and um, flows are actually written into tables there can be more than one table uh, and as soon as a packet comes in um, this packet is matched against a table um, uh, to see if there is a match and if there is a match then the action um, takes place so uh, what we have seen is about open flow uh, right now now uh, we are just going to move on and uh, i'm going to talk about uh, sdn controllers in general um, and in specific about uh, open daylight so so what is an sdn controller um, as we as we already know this um, an sdn controller is the uh, is is you know, supposed to be the brain of the network it is the one taking uh, uh you know all the decisions and it is decoupled decoupled from the switch itself so uh, an sdn controller essentially has about three uh, you know various kinds of layers in it which is the application layer then you have a control layer and then you have an infrastructure layer so this is how the uh, you know sdn architecture is so there is actually a set of programmable open apis like um, like rest for example uh, with which third party applications and orchestration layers used to talk to the sdn controller and the sdn controller in turn talks to all of the network devices like our you know hp um, hp 5900 switches um, by another protocol called as which we have just seen so this is the three pronged um, uh, uh, you know architecture that we see uh, with a generic sdn controller uh, and we know that it's uh, actually the strategic control point in the sdn network now uh coming coming specifically to open daylight um open daylight um open daylight is actually an open source uh uh sdn controller which which has hosted uh, as part of the linux foundation um and open daylight um is you know aiming to be the sdn controller uh uh, uh you know all pervasive uh, just like open stack um so so how does open daylight look like um 
I know that this diagram is, uh, you know, pretty pretty detailed and has a lot of details, but uh, at least for the purposes of this discussion, we can just abstract it out. Um, open daylight, if you look at the central piece of open daylight, consists of something called as a service abstraction layer. So this service abstraction layer, or SAL as it is called, is actually based on something called as OSGI. Uh, so OSGI is a Java-based framework, which helps you to... Uh, or dynamically plug modules in and out. So, for example, if you have the controller running, uh, and this controller can be run as part of a VM, um, when you have the controller running uh, and you want to plug in additional modules, it's all dynamic and it does not need to, uh, you know, disrupt the running of the existing controller. So, um, all of the different, um, uh, you know, southbound interfaces that we see here are in the form of plugins. So. So you have the SDN controller, which has uh, which has an abstraction layer. It uses REST, um, uh, you know, at the northbound uh, for for requests to come in, and uh, these requests are all handled by the service abstraction layer. And this SAL layer knows which plugin to call depending on the request that is coming in. So when you make a REST call uh, to the open, uh, you know, daylight uh, uh, controller. Um, the open delight controllers sal comes into the picture and it then uh, you know forwards the request to the appropriate uh, plugin which can be openflow based it can be ovsdb based netconf you know list bgp and so on and so forth these plugins in turn then go and talk to the openv switches or the uh, you know virtual and physical devices that are there uh, so the other important thing that i wanted to mention here was that um, Yang um, is the model which is used for general purpose, uh, is the uh, language which is used for general purpose modeling. Um, so what does it mean? Um, when we have, when we have uh, a request which is coming into Open Daylight, uh, that request, uh, say it involves one or more than one plugin. Now, if we want to talk from, uh, talk, talk, talk between plugins, for example, if I want to talk, um, from one plugin to the other, there needs to be a uniform way for the request to get translated from one plugin to the other plugin. So although Yang is not generally used for this purpose, inside of OpenStack it is used as a general purpose modeling uh, language with which um, we are actually using Yang uh, to you know, describe the, the, uh, the you know, resources of Open Daylight. And we are also using Yang uh, as a means to talk between plugins and between resources, and hence making it type safe as well. So that's about open daylight. Um, so, the, so what I then wanted to talk about is, um, uh, you know, coming on to the demo that I have. Um, I I have actually uh, used Mininet uh, and Open Daylight. So Mininet is the emulator software that is used in this demo. Um, Mininet uh, basically allows you to create a network topology uh, both in a custom uh, and as well as a lot of uh, out of the box features. So Mininet allows me to create, uh, you know, switches, hosts, and then connect them to a controller which is both remote as well as local. So what happens is each of these each of these switches that are there actually are are you know namespaces within themselves so all of the switches exist within the root namespace and each of the um, each of the hosts that we have are are i don't know separate uh, ip namespaces themselves so um, and then uh, when i have when i have a topology like this i can then hook it up with the controller and with the controller i can then start putting flows inside of the switches and and can uh, then emulate the entire network fabric that i have so as we've seen earlier, uh, Open Daylight uh, takes in REST APIs um, uh, uh, at the northbound part. And uh, since since our controller here is going to be Open Daylight, I've used uh, Postman, uh, which is actually a Chrome extension uh, and which can act as a REST client for me to uh, you know make all the REST calls into the controller. Um, so apart from that, inside of the REST calls themselves, I've uh, I've used Yang models um, uh, to send out uh, XML-based uh, XML-based uh, you know requests to both the uh, controller um, as well as the switches themselves. So so I'll just pause here. I know I've been going at breakneck speed. Uh, are there any questions that are there before I actually go on to the demo?
Adi, there was a question from Nitin about the version of OpenFlow. Uh, it is 1.3, right? You are using. Uh, yeah, I'm using 1.3.1. 1, 1 uh, yeah, actually, the, why I asked this question? Because 1.3 talks about group table too. Correct, yeah. Yeah, so, correct. So, uh, I'm not utilizing uh, group tables in my demo here, but then I understand that uh, group tables are also part of 1.3. Uh, they were uh, basically introduced uh, after the 1.1. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so so when it comes to the use cases uh, and the comp uh, and the different components that I'm using, um, I'm using one uh, OpenFlow 1.3.1. .1. Uh, I'm using the Open Daylight Helium release. Um, uh, I'm using the Mininet emulator, uh, Postman uh, REST client to send out REST requests, and I'm also using Yang models, uh, basically um, to um, to you know, talk to the individual uh, resources that are uh, exposed to open daylight. Uh, so I'm going to demonstrate uh, two use cases here. And the first use case is going to be that I'm just going to block hosts at will. So I'm going to show you the topology that I have um, after the topology uh, is uh, created. Um, all, all of the hosts inside of the topology will be in the same subnet. Uh, I'm then going to showcase a drop action just to showcase that um, I can I can put in flows which will, which will basically uh, help me to block, uh, you know, either one host or the other. Um, so this is how um, this is how my my uh, you know, use case is going to flow. Um, I have the Open Daylight controller on top, uh, and I have Mininet below. Mininet is going to emulate the uh, networking fabric that I've shown here. It's going to create three hosts, all of them in the same subnet. And and then I'm going to attach the host uh, to the controller. Uh, and then we're going to see what will happen. So what then happens is that as soon as I uh, hook up Mininet, uh, you know, Mininet's open flow switch, uh, that is open the switch, to the controller, the, the you know, controller actually puts in a set of rules which will which will make the switch uh, flow table um, uh, to act like a hub. So this will mean that as soon as any packet comes in to the switch, the the you know flows that have been put in to the open B switch make it act like a hub, and and every packet which is coming in is actually broadcasted. So if I want to ping uh, H3 say from H1, what would happen is the packet would come in from H3, get into the switch. And the switch is dumb and it's a hub. And you know, packets are uh, gone to H3 and H2 and to the controller as well. Uh, so as soon as the responses come in from H2 and H3, those responses are also broadcast and all packets are sent to the controller as well. So what, what happens then is that the you know, controller, um, controller realizes that that each of these ports have their, you know, specific MAC addresses, and then it puts in additional rules inside of the uh, table, um, uh, inside of the flow table of the switch, and this makes the uh, switch not act as a hub, but as soon as a packet comes in, it will, you know, redirect it to the appropriate location. So what happens then is, if I want to ping from H3 to N1, uh, H H1 or or H1 to H3, the uh, packet flow would be. Uh, directly from H1 to H3 and not a flood. So, and then if I want to showcase the rule of, uh, you know, blocking blocking traffic to one host or the other, what would happen is uh, I'll then have to uh, put in a flow into open daylight, which would say, say, block H3. Those rules are then transmitted onto the switch. The, you know, switch's flow table is updated. And then the switch knows that it needs to block H3, uh, you know, from now onwards. And H3 is blocked. And if I if I have to do a ping all, for example, only H2 and H1 will be reachable, whereas H3 will then uh, cease to be reachable. So this is the um, first use case that I have. And then similarly, I can, uh, you know, go ahead and say block it. The same thing happens uh, the other way around. Uh, the, you know, switch 
realizes that H2 also needs to be blocked now, or you know, only H2 needs to be blocked, and it will block H2, and um, H1 and H3 would be reachable, whereas H2 uh, would you know, cease to be reachable anymore. Um, so I'll just go ahead and showcase the demo there, uh, here. Um, we have um, the you know, topology created via Mininet, where I am specifying that my topology would contain a, uh, contain a single switch. It would have three hosts, and um, and the you know, controller would be a remote, where it would be 1074.22.3, which is the ODL system here. So, you know, Open Daylight is actually already installed, and uh, and an Open Daylight can run as uh, either a VM, uh, and inside of a VM it can run as a background process, or it can be executed like an executable straight away, which is what I have done. I have uh, gone ahead and list uh, and you know installed a list of features, which is to show that uh, you know Open Daylight is not is not only capable of open flow, but it is capable of much more else, like uh, you know say SNMP or um, you know, uh, it can do a lot of other things like BGP and uh, so on and so forth. So, um, so this is the initial uh, rules which are there uh, inside the um, controller, uh, and these controllers uh, and these rules are sent in by the controller uh, to the switch. So, if I look at the rules here, it says that these are the rules which make this um, uh, switch act like a hub. That as soon as uh, an input packet is coming inside the uh, port 3. It would be sent to port 1, port 2, and the controller as well. So these are the three rules which are there. And then I have an additional rule which says that if the uh, type is 0x88cc, uh, which is the which is the type for uh, you know LLDP. LLDP is a neighbor discovery protocol. Um, uh, that as soon as an LLDP packet comes uh, inside of the switch this packet needs to go on to the controller directly. And then I have something called as a table miss rule. That means that inside of table zero, if all of these rules are not being satisfied, then the controller uh, tells the switch that, you know, you just need to go ahead and drop the packet. So now if I go ahead and uh, try to ping, I see that H1 is going on to H2 and H3. H2 is uh, able to reach H1 and H3, and uh, H3 is also able to reach the other two hosts. Uh, if I start looking at the flows then, now, I'll see that there have been six additional flows added in, which tell the controller, uh, uh, I'm sorry, each, um, they actually tell the switch that from now on, uh, if the source is one and the destination is two, directly put the packet on two and don't flood the entire um, you know, network with it. Uh, similarly, there are rules for uh, when, when the you know source is two, when the destination is one, directly put it on one. Uh, so these are the different rules that are there right now. Now, uh, apart from that, if I have to um, go ahead and demonstrate the uh, block, uh, um, uh, you know, rule that I have, I'll just go and uh, you know go ahead and execute a rest call. So this rest call is actually putting this flow in table zero and the flow ID is going to 136. So what is the um, flow going to look like? The flow is going to say that if the destination is 0002, then execute the drop action. So if I send this flow, I should see that the flow table is updated. And I see that this has come in right at the top, which says that if the destination is 002, just drop the packet. Now, if I try to bring ping, can you tell like what that 136 was? I missed uh, that part. Yeah, so 136 is the ID of the flow. So 136 is the oh, ID okay, of the flow. Okay, 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 that's it. Okay, all right. Yeah. Yeah, so inside of the table, uh, I mean, I have table IDs to to actually represent which table I'm going to put the flow in, and I have a flow ID to actually flow. say that this is going to be the uh, ID of the flow. Okay, so all these information can it be retrieved from the controller, uh, or how do you how do you actually yes. do that? Yeah, so basically, um, as soon as I send the flow, if I can, if I just execute a get on all the flows, um, okay. I mean, since this follows the uh, in rest paradigm, I can do get, put, delete, and uh, so on and okay, so forth. Okay, okay, okay. So okay. so when I do a get on all the flows, I'll get the list of all the uh, 
flows which are there on the controller. Uh, so now that uh, two is there, if I try to ping uh, two, I'll see that the packets are being dropped, and four packets have been transmitted, and uh, there is packet loss. And if you see the uh, if you see the uh, rules again, we see that the packets counter has increased. Uh, where it was zero, it has increased to seven now. So this is the um, these are the different. Uh, um, so this is to demonstrate that we can uh, have uh, counters as well. Now I'm uh, you know purging all the rules here, and if I send in the drop H3 now, I'll see that. That if the destination is three, now the action is going to be that it has to drop, and I have a priority of 15, meaning to say that it is more than the priority of the other flows which are you know tested for three, and hence when a packet is coming in for three, this flow is the one which will get executed over the other flow. So now if I go ahead and try to ping H3, H3 is getting blocked here, and I'll see that. Number of packets in this flow are also increasing. I have a packet count which is increasing from zero to six. So this is the uh, you know first use case that I have, um, and the second use case. Uh, uh, before I get there, uh, are there uh, any other questions here? Uh, guys, you are on mute. So if you want to. Just ask any question, please unmute and ask. Yeah, either you're on mute or you don't have any questions, and it's and the world's a nice place. So, okay. Um, so the next use case that I have is uh, is you know what I call a fake router. That's I'm just using the uh, I know which to just do IP forwarding. So what I have in this scenario is I have two hosts which are in two different subnets, and I'm going to have a host which I'm calling as the ARP host. This host is responsible for uh, you know giving out ARP requests whenever uh, you know this host or the other host needs it. So so the subnet of this host is going to be 10.0.1.0/24, and the subnet of H2 is going to be 10.0.2.0/24. So so our objective is that as soon as a packet comes in here, the uh, in a switch by itself will do the IP forwarding of the packet, uh, and the gateway, which is 10.0.1 and 10.0.2.1, is not involved in the uh, in a forwarding of the packet. So the set of rules I'll be uh, you know putting in here is is um, is as follows, and the first rule that I'll be putting here is that as soon as an ARP request comes in to the switch. I'll ask the switch to flood that ARP request, uh, and hence, when I, from one, from you know H1, when I'm starting to ping H2, what would happen is since H2 is in a different subnet H1, um, I'll be uh, H1 will ask for the ARP, uh, I mean, will ask for the MAC of the gateway because it has to go via the gateway. So, so the packet would look something like this: the source MAC is MAC1. And the destination IP is 10.0.200, and the destination MAC is the MAC of the gateway. So since it doesn't know the MAC of the gateway, it'll ask, it'll, it'll you know send out an ARP request. The ARP request request would be who has the MAC for 10.0.1.1. And since we've put a rule which actually flooding uh, all ARP requests, that request is flooded to both H2 and to H1 as well. Uh, um, and to the ARP host as well. The ARP host then sends a packet back as unicast, and H1 now has the MAC of the gateway. So now, um, if the if I would not put any other additional um, uh, you know rule here, this is the packet flow that would happen. Uh, H1 would come onto H3. H3 has Two NICs, that is 1.1 and 
Edge 3 uh, as a host by itself has IP forwarding enabled in it. So it will it will it will put the packet from 1 to 2 and 2 will then send it to Edge 2. But the uh, I mean, that's not what I want. Uh, you know that would just be demonstrating the capability of a Linux stack. It's not what I want. What I want is for this switch to actually act as an IP forwarding uh, 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 you know device. So what will then happen is I'll put in two rules which says that if the source MAC is one and the destination MAC is three and the destination IP is 10 to 100 change the packet such that the destination MAC is replaced by by three. Uh, it's re It actually replaces three with two. So and then what happens is as soon as a packet comes in here, the destination MAC is changed from three to two. And the switch takes the packet from port one and puts it onto port two directly. And the additional thing that we are doing is we are blocking everything from uh, you know any packet to end uh, you know from entering uh, h3 so h3 cannot act as a gateway even if it wants to and the switch is directly putting the package from p1 to p2 so i'll just demonstrate that part as well So I've um, I've written a, a Python um, you know piece of Python code for demonstrating the um, you know creating the topology inside of uh, inside of Mininet. And I'll just show you the so this is pretty simple. I just have uh, three hosts. This host is going to act as the R host, and what I have is that I'm specifying the IP and the default route for each of these hosts and I'm going to connect them to a switch. So uh, this is just to uh, you know highlight the fact that uh, Python has uh, Mininet has a Python API uh, which is exposed which we can utilize to create uh, custom topologies. So now we have uh, three hosts. First host has 10.0.100. Second host has 10.0.200. I'm going to configure three virtual IPs on the um, on the third host to make it as the ARP serving. Uh, and I'm also going to clear the uh, Now I'm going to put in the rules uh, from the Postman client that I have here. So I've already created a collection of flows that I can use. Uh, so the first flow that I'm going to uh, do is I'm going to put in the ARP flood rule. So for that, I need to know the Ethernet type. So the Ethernet type of ARP is 0x806. I've just converted that to decimal and I'm putting it here. Uh, and the output needs to be flood. Um, and I just have to go into, uh, you know, specify the table and the ID of the flow. So once I do that, the uh, flow is going to come in. And oh. so I'll see this flow coming in, which says that uh, if the you know protocol is ARP, go ahead and flood the entire network. Uh, now I'm going to put the uh, flow from 1 to 2, which actually is going to replace the MAC when the uh, packet is coming from 1 and it's destined for 2. I'm going to do the flow. Uh, I'm going to put in the flow, which is vice versa as well. That is when, when, when the packet is coming in from 2 and when it is going into 1, I'm going to uh, you know replace the uh, MAC of the packet again. And then finally, I'm going to say any flow which is destined for 3, drop it straight away. 
so if I look at the flows now, I see four flows coming in, three of these, and then the first one is the art flow again. And now if I ping H1 to H2, I have connectivity. And if I ping back from H2 to H1, uh, I have connectivity again. But if I ping H3 directly, I should not see any traffic coming in. Similarly, if I ping from H2 to H3, there should not be any uh, responses. So this is basically to showcase that uh, how you know Mininet uh, OpenFlow and OpenDaylight can be used to create IP forwarding uh, switches uh, out of uh, you know OpenB switch. Um, that's all that I have. Um, two use cases, and if there are any other questions, I'll be happy to take them. So any questions, guys? OK. So uh, in that case, uh, we will uh, conclude the presentation. I hope it was useful. And we'll do more in-depth in -depth presentations in the future. And thanks, Adi, for the presentation. And uh, I'll conclude this call. Uh, thank you, everybody. Thanks.